I invite you to please turn in your Bibles. We're going to be in two places for the scripture reading. Galatians 5, 14 to 25. And Matthew 22, 34 to 40. So two different places. We'll see how well you can keep up since I have mine pre-tabbed. Oh, my. <laughs> if you don't have a Bible, we do have some in the back, just to the right of the sound booth. Please take one. Keep it if you don't have a single Bible at all. We want you to have it. So we're in Galatians 5, verses 14 to 20, 25. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, and all things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Turning over to Matthew 22. 34 to 40. This is a very familiar passage. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked asked him a question to test him, saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. So children can be dismissed for Children's Church. Uh, if this is your first time here and you don't know, we do have classes for students pre-K all the way through 8th grade. Um, if They're more than welcome to attend. We just ask if you haven't checked in, just stop by that check-in table and get them all checked in at the desk. As for the rest of us, let's dive on in to Galatians. We typically do expository preaching, looking at books of the Bible, whole books, verse by verse, chapter by chapter tracking the original thought and intent of the author as the books were written. But we're taking a bit of a break uh, for the next um, eight weeks after this, uh, studying the fruit of the Spirit, which is a part of Paul's letter to the Galatians. Even though we're not going through the whole book, it's still important that we understand context and know why Paul was talking about these fruit when he brought it up to them. So... Uh, Pastor Lou did a whole intro to this last week, but I just want to recap it before we move forward because it lays the foundation for why I'm even going to bother talking about love this morning. So Paul's writing to the church of Galatia, and just like every body of believers, they weren't perfect. Shocking, I know. They weren't. They weren't perfect, <clears throat> and they were falling prey to the teaching of the Judaizers, who were proclaiming justification through the law. They were being taught that their right standing with God was dependent on how well they obeyed the law. Now, there are over 600 laws to be kept in the Old Testament scriptures, made up of three categories, ceremonial, civil, and moral. And perfect obedience to these laws is an impossibility. And... Doing so has no power to justify us. That's why Paul is writing to them. To communicate that, rather, our justification is through faith alone in Christ alone. Paul made that clear in Galatians 2.16. He says, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, 
but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So Paul didn't mince words there. He was pretty, pretty straightforward. And the reason why he was is because it was absolutely vital that they and we understand our justification, our being declared righteous before a holy and righteous God is based fully on Christ's perfect and atoning work on the cross. And nothing that we've ever done or will do. Our obedience is not our means of justification, but a result of receiving it. And that's something we need to just always remember. We're justified by Christ alone. Obedience is called for by Christ himself. Matthew 28. He tells them, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We're called to obey and observe all that Christ commanded. So what's the difference between what the Judaizers are teaching and what Christ is pro proclaiming? And it's motivation. It's the motivation for why we obey. The difference is between trusting in the law to receive God's love, favor, and acceptance and justification versus I have been justified through the perfect work of Christ and all that he's done. And because of that, because I know I am loved, the result is I want to obey. I want to follow what Christ has said. There's a difference. And if you didn't write this down last week, when Pastor Lou mentioned it, you might want to write it down this week and for the next eight weeks. He said this, this phrase, and I hope you caught it. There's a major difference between a morally restrained heart dependent on the law and a supernaturally renewed heart resting in the gospel. There's a difference between a, a major difference between the morally constrained heart dependent on the law and a supernaturally renewed heart resting in the gospel. Relying on the law and self-righteous striving cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit are only produced by internal gospel growth and by the work of, you guessed it, the Spirit. Law can curb the symptom, but the gospel reaches inward to transform the actual problem. The problem of sin. Example, laws against murder. Right? Right? Laws against murder will probably reduce the amounts of murder because people don't want to get punished. But it doesn't reach inward to transform the actual problem of anger and hatred in the sin that produces the murder. Only the work of the Holy Spirit inside of us does that. It's not about striving harder in our own efforts to, to do any of these things. To love better, to have more joy, just to force myself to, to be at peace. Just really try to be patient. It's just not how it works. If we just try harder, we're going to fail. And we're going to be like, oh, I didn't try hard enough. And we're just going to beat ourselves up. But we are called, rather, to submit ourselves to the work of the Spirit and allow the Spirit and the gospel to change our hearts and to change our motivations. The Spirit nullifies the work of the flesh, the flesh and produces within us fruit. Fruit. And that fruit consists of love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All one fruit. Not fruits, multiple. All one fruit. Growing, growing to to together as a clustered fruit. If I keep swallowing my tongue, this is going to be a long sermon. <laughs> they grow. These fruits, they grow at different rates, but they're all growing together. So we may see... More of one than the other, but they, they're all there as one fruit of the Spirit. The only one who embodied them perfectly was God himself through Jesus Christ. We're never going to do it, but we continue to grow in them throughout our lives as the Spirit of God is at work in us, conforming us to look more like Christ and to help us grow in that. With that introduction, the first characteristic we're going to talk about is love. And we're going to look at that, look at three things as we explore that. We're going to answer the question, 
What is love? We're going to look at how we are loved and that we are called to love. What is love? Paul, Paul intentionally lists love first because of the importance of it. It's foundational. I mean, just a few verses as we, before this, as we read in verse 14, he says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love is important to Paul. Love is important to, to God. And love is foundational in living out the gospel. But before we can talk about love as it pertains to the fruit of the Spirit, we have to define exactly what kind of love we're talking about. Because love is a word that we just throw around left and right. Like, we'll sing in the song how much we love God, how much he loves us. And like, I love my wife. I love, <laughs> I love my friends. But then at the same time, I'm like, I love pizza, and I love TV shows, and I love this app on my phone. Like, there's no way any of those can be equal. So when we hear love and we use love, we have these preconceived notions of what it is. So I think it's important that we define it. The character Newman in Seinfeld, you know I had to get one in there. He tries to define love. And he says, love is a spice with many tastes, a dizzying array of textures and moments. I don't think that's what Paul is talking about. So, it would be helpful for us in English if we had, like, f different forms of love to describe exactly what application we're using, but we don't. We just say love. But fortunately for us, the Greek does. So we'll go through real quick, like we did a few weeks ago when Lou talked about it, what the Greek words for love are, and then we'll see where we're at in this passage. So there's the, the first one, which is storge, which is like an affectionate love, like that of a parent to a child. Um, which is not actually really seen in the New Testament. There's another word, eros. That's a, a passionate physical love, which we don't see used in the scriptures. Then there's phileo, brotherly love, mutualistic love. We see that. We saw it a few times in John. And then lastly, but certainly not least, is agape. Agape with the highest kind of love, an unconditional self-sacrificial love. So when Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love, he says agape. When John says God is love in 1 John 4, verse 8, he uses the word agape. So the fruit of the Spirit is agape, a godly, selfless, sacrificial love. That's what Paul's talking about. The love that should grow in us and the love that was shown to us in the gospel is agape love. And if there's one fruit in this list of fruits that has no lacking of definition in the scriptures, it's love. And thankfully we have a lot about it and we're going to learn about it here. If you would turn with me, I'm going to throw a curveball at you. 1 Corinthians 13, one I did not read earlier. 1 Corinthians 13. I'm sure some of you know this as the love chapter. It's all about love. And, and in, this, <clears throat> in this passage, what Paul does is he, he shows us the necessity for love and the nature of love. We see this passage read at weddings a lot, which it certainly applies to. But it by no means only applies to marriage relationships. This is all about our Christian lives, and our Christian worship together as believers in Christ. So we're going to hang out here in chapter 13 for a little bit as we look at first the necessity for love. Verses 1 through 3. Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Again, Paul starts this list of the fruit 
with love because it's foundational. It's vital. It's a necessity. The things that we say, the things that we do should be rooted in selfless and sacrificial love. They should be motivated by the love that was shown towards us in the gospel. I mean, look at this list. Paul lists many good and virtuous things. Speaking in the tongues of men and angels, prophecy, understanding mysteries and knowledge. He says faith that can move mountains, giving away all the poor, even giving one's life to be burned. But he says they're essentially worthless without love at, as the motivation. We can do a lot of good things, we can do a lot of Christian things, but if they're, they're all for nothing, if they're not rooted in gospel love. 1 John 4, 19 says, We love because He, that is God, first loved us. What we do needs to be motivated by the love that has been shown to us. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't love us, care for us, and redeem us because we got it right. Because we were already loving perfectly. It's while we were yet sinners. And as re- recipients of that love, our motivation to do these things should come from that love. All the ministries we do, the benevolence, the serving, the, the singing, the teaching, all of it needs to be rooted in love. Otherwise, we're just making noise, like a clanging cymbal. This passage, it it acts as a reality check. It it forces forces me, it forces all of us to ask the question, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I serving? Why am I participating in ministries? Why are we here for corporate worship this morning? Why Why am I helping others? Why do I do any of it? Because it makes me feel less guilty, or it makes me feel more holy, because I want the recognition and makes for a good social media post, I can just check it off my list. Or their motivation, because God loved me so much and gave his son for me, brought me from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. I want to love, serve, and worship him. I want to minister to others because of the love and redemption that I've been given. What a difference it makes when the attention goes off of ourselves and on to God. And I include myself in this, because I need to ask myself these questions every day. Every week, I stand up here. Why am I doing it? And that shift of attention is the work of the Spirit. That's the difference between a morally restrained heart dependent on the law versus a supernaturally renewed heart resting in the gospel. We need our We need to live our lives as worship to God in love because of the love that we've been shown. It's a necessity. It's foundational. It's vital. Let's look at the nature of that love. So there's a necessity. What does that love look like? What is the nature of it? It's not eros. Look what he says. For the eight. Four through eight. He says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease, and as for knowledge, it will pass away. So Paul gives us a pretty good idea on what love looks like. The first thing we see is love is patient. Love is patient. Now this is more than just like keeping your composure where someone's just really annoying and frustrating. It's more than that, though it's part of it, because that's a really good thing when we're able to do that. But what patient really means is it's long-suffering. Love is patient and, and perseveres through misfortune and trouble, through offenses occurred. It's, it's patient. It can endure it. Love is also kind, meaning it should be polite. It should be friendly and considerate. 
uh, the Greek word actually could mean mild-mannered to some degree. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Or as the NASB translation says, uh, is not jealous. So love does not boil with hatred or anger or disdain. Which is similar to that of what love is not, irritable or resentful. So it does not envy. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not boast. We're humans. We're good at boasting. And we're really good at boasting about ourselves. Really good at it. But if we do boast, we are to boast in Christ and his accomplished work. Paul said it twice. He said, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Love, a biblical spirit Empowered love does not enable us to brag on ourselves or boast in ourselves, but should always point us to Christ and to exalting him. Love does not boast in ourselves, but boasts in Christ. Love is not arrogant or rude. Love produced by the Spirit doesn't puff up with pride and doesn't act unbecoming. It's like a contrast to patient and kind, to be arrogant and rude. Love does not insist on its own way. We said earlier, agape love, it's this self-sacrificial love, non-self-seeking love. It's the kind of gospel love that, that Paul talks about in Philippians 2 when he says to treat others as you would be treated in the gospel. We don't have time to actually turn there and look in depth at that, but maybe it's something you can look at. In First Corinthians or uh, in community group, as as Paul expands on what what that relationship of love not insisting on its own way looks like. What else does love not do? Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love doesn't rejoice in sin and the downfall of others, though sometimes we do. We shouldn't. Love does not do that. It should grieve us. And love does, love does rejoice in the truth. Good truths and hard truths. Love rejoices in the truth. Then Paul gives us this sentence. He says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Bearing means to, to protect or to, to, to hold out against. To come alongside and help persevere. Like bearing one another's burdens. Love bears all things. And then we, at the end of that sentence, we have endures all things. So it's pretty similar. It means to withstand until the end. To remain and to not fall back. And sandwiched between bearing and enduring are these two things. Belief and hope. Now what Paul's talking about, he's not talking about like a uh, love believes and hopes in, in all religions and in, in all gods of the world. That's not what he's saying. He's talking in the context of believer to believer. When love believes all things, is Paul is saying that love believes the best of others. But believes and, and hopes the best for them. To bear one another's burdens, we believe the best of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we, we hope for their best, not their downfall, because love does not rejoice in that. And with those who we're believing in and hoping in, we're enduring till the end. We're believing the best of each other. We're hoping for each other's best. And we endure till the end. And lastly, love never ends. Or as some translation puts it, love never ends fails. Meaning that gospel love, godly love will not be overthrown, will not be brought down. All these outward things that Paul lists in verses 1 through 3, they're going to come to an end. But the Holy Spirit filled deep inward love will not come to an end. God defines this love. God is this love. And love will persevere forever. That's the nature of that love. Now, before I move on from this, uh, I'm, I'm sure 
and, and going through the list, probably like I was in my office writing it, like slouching in the seat, like, oh, love is not this, it is this. Oh, my gosh. We look at it, we examine it, and we use it just to see just how good and loving God is, because God is all these things. And though we strive for it, we just have to realize we're never going to do that perfect. That's, I mean, that's the goal. That's where we'd be like, I want to be patient. I want to be kind. I don't want to envy. I don't want to brag on myself. But there's going to be times when I do. And passages like this, they just, they help us to see, you know what, this is the mark. I missed it. I can repent. God is faithful and just to forgive me when I confess this sin. And we ask the Spirit to help us to do better next time. And that's the Christian life. And we need that reminder. We're not justified by, by doing all these perfectly either, right? The same thing. We need this reminder because the next time we're driving in the car and someone cuts us off without a directional and we lose our minds, we can be thankful that we know that we didn't just lose our justification. The only one who lived this perfectly on earth was Jesus Christ himself. It's what we strive for in the gospel. It's what we can check our actions by. But when we miss the mark, there's repentance and forgiveness. That's what we rest in. We look at this and we go, that's my goal. That's Christ. Help me to look more like him. And it's a lifelong process. Love is selfless. It's sacrificial. It's an outpouring of a heart transformed by the gospel. And as I mentioned earlier, we love because God first loved us. And that's what I want to look at next as we look at we are loved. So we're going to, 1 John 4, 7 to 12. John's writing to believers. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And in in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And in this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. As humans, we have this innate, natural, deep need to be loved. I don't think it's a desire. It's a need. We have it. We, we search it out in our lives through all these different ways. But in this passage, we see that God's love meets our greatest need. John says here that the love of God was made manifest. That is, the love of God was made plain to see or, or obvious among us in that he sent his son into the world that we might live through him. Remember, love is selfish and sacrificial. Self, did I say selfish? Selfless. If, even if I did, selfless. <laughs> so... God, who is love, God is love, looks down, sees us, all a mess, fallen, rebelling, and he demonstrates his love perfectly to us, despite our rebellion, despite our sinful nature, despite how we have wronged him. God sends Jesus to live a perfect sinless life we couldn't live and die the death we deserved because of his love for us. How different are God's ways than our ways, right? It, if it were me, I think I would probably act differently towards those who are wronging me. And that's why it's a very, 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 not enough very good thing that I'm not God. We're made in his image, but sin has distorted it. But we're valued and we're treasured by him. 
Maybe this is your first time hearing that, like you're valued and treasured by God. You are. The world would have us believed we just sit in nothing, but, but God hates you and can't stand you. He loves you. He values you. And that's why he offers salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. How do we know he loves us? He literally tells us. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We just sang about this and how deep the father's love. He would give his only son to make a wretch a treasure. And it's not like only God the Father is loving and like God the, and, and Jesus Christ got the short end of the stick. One God, three persons. Jesus loves us and gave himself for us. He willingly laid down his life for his friends. God willingly allowed his beloved son to be sacrificed for us. Tim Keller puts it best where he says, the gospel is that I am so flawed that Jesus Christ had to die for me, yet I am so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? God makes his love vivid to us through Christ. Christ took on the full wrath of the Father on the cross. That's what propitiation means. As we saw back in first, yeah, there we go. Back in first John, he says he's the propitiation. That means he's the wrath bearer. He took on the wrath that we deserved. He bore it. Does that sound familiar? Love bears all things. Christ bore our greatest burden to meet our greatest need. It doesn't get any more loving than that. God can't love us any more than he does. And there's nothing that we can do in the gospel that will make him love us any less. That's good news. Do you believe that? And in this love, we are called to love. We see it. In this passage, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It's a call to love, to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit in the inward gospel growth inside. So we are called to love. And this is what brings us to Matthew 22, 34 to 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. I'm just going to read it again. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. He said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Love is a necessity. The nature of that love is selfless and sacrificial. And we see that perfectly through God's love for us in the gospel. And we're called to love as a result. Warren Worsby puts it really well in his commentary when he says, For God, what God the Father planned for you, and God the Son purchased for you on the cross, God the Spirit personalizes for you and applies to your life as you yield to him. I'll say that again. What God the Father planned for you, God the Son purchased for you on the cross, God the Spirit personalizes for you and applies to your life as you yield to him. The Spirit at work in us produces gospel fruit. And that part of that is love. Love must flow two directions. That's what Jesus shows us. Vertically and horizontally. Vertically, our love for God. And horizontally, our love for each other. It's both. And Jesus says that on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Basically, if we just keep 
two things will be good to go with all the other laws. The problem is, is you take a, a list of 600, condense it down to two, we still screw up. I mean, that was a significant decrease. <laughs> we still can't be justified by doing it because we'll never do it perfect. It's through faith alone and Christ alone. These two commandments have nothing to do with our becoming justified, but this love is a result of that justification. That's something I feel like needs to just be 100% clear. Like As we keep going through it, just remember, these two things are to be obeyed as a result of our justification, not for it. It's a process, slow and steady. The whole idea with, with gospel growth is that we should be able to, to look back and, and we don't feel it, and we don't see it in the moment, but we look back and see how the Spirit's been at work. It's kind of like, you know, measuring like the child's head against like a door jam or something against the wall. It's like you have like the three-year-old and then like all of a sudden, if you're they're like 18, you're still doing it for some reason. Um, and it's like, wow, there's a big difference between those two. That's how it is with the Spirit. We grow slowly, steadily. We may not even recognize it, but the Spirit's working. So how do we grow in these two commands? I think there's three things. Like, we're, we're talking about fruit. We're talking about plant-ish stuff here. Plants need three basic, basic things to grow. Water, light, and air. That's what they need. You take... take those away, the plant's not going to grow as well or at all. Now, of course, there's specifics for each kind of plant on, on how much of each, but essentially they need those three things. For us to grow in the gospel and to grow in our love for God and neighbor, here are three practical things that we, that we need. And I don't think any of them will shock you. The first one that we need in order to grow in the gospel is being in the Word and reminding ourselves of the Gospel through reading it. A daily reminder, we need daily reminders of, of, of the love that God shows for us. Just like we talked about, the whole last point, we, we are loved. I already mentioned it in point one. I needed a whole other point for it because we, we forget so quickly just how much God loves us and cares for us. We need to relish in that love. And we get... We see that throughout all of Scripture. We need to spend time in the Word reminding ourselves, preaching ourselves the gospel every day. The more we learn about God's love for us through His Word, the more we're able to pour that back to Him in love and to others in love. So the first thing we need, we need the Word of God. We need to be in it. We need to be reminding ourselves of the gospel. The second thing we need is prayer. We need to spend time talking to God. Enjoying the fellowship that we receive through, through Christ's sacrifice. He gives us that access. We need to, to thank God for who He is, all He's done. Confess sin, repent, ask to forg for forgiveness, rejoice in that forgiveness. We can bring Him our needs and our burdens. We can hear from God through His word. And we can talk to God in prayer. I mean, relationships are two-way, right? We, he talks, we listen, we talk, he listens. Be in the Word, pray. And the last thing that we need, community. Community. We grow in our ability to love, especially love your neighbor as yourself. We grow in that. As we spend time with actual other people who we can love. And it's through those relationships that we, we can sharpen one another. That we can help each other understand the scriptures and share our lives. God, God has designed the church to grow together, not in isolation. And community is also where the, the fun and messy aspects of love come out. Because we're going to do something that's going to offend someone and we're going to have to reconcile it. We do that in love, in community. That's a part of living life together. 
When we think of love, we, we think of 1 Corinthians 13 with being patient and kind and, and all those things. We go, I, I can get it. I get it. I can wrap my mind around it. But there's another aspect of love that doesn't quite feel as loving, but it's love. And it's that aspect of love that is in community calling each other out where we need to be called out. Pointing out, not judgmentally like, I got this major plank and I'm just going to like hone in on your little speck. Not like in that way. We're talking a gospel, mutual, you call me out, I call you out. It's going to sting, it's going to hurt. But loving is also pointing out when there's sin in life. That's a part of love. It doesn't feel good. I don't think it ever feels good. Especially not to have it pointed out, but to point it out. But it's necessary in love. If I'm loving my neighbor as myself, well, if I'm heading down a path that's leading me to death, I think it's more loving for someone to point me to life rather than just let me go, keep going on that path because my feelings might get hurt. The call to love is not about feelings. It's about well-being. Feelings can, can be mended. Now it sounds like, wow, that was a little, that was a little rough. That's how it is. It stings because we tend to love the sin we're in, but eventually that sting stops when we see the error of our ways and realize the love that we were called out in. I felt like I couldn't leave that because that's a big piece of loving. It's who God is. The scripture says God disciplines who he loves. But that's in the context of community. I can't just walk up to Joe Schmo and, and just be like, you stink. You need to turn or burn. Like, I mean, I guess I could, but I'd be a jerk and that probably wouldn't work. It's in community. Mutual gospel community. We both recognize the love of God shown to us. We need these three things, right? The word, prayer, and community to help us grow in our vertical love for God and our horizontal love for others. And lastly, I just want to answer the, the, the question, who is our neighbor? Because we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus answers this in the parable of the Good Samaritan with the answer being, essentially, whoever you come in contact with and you see in need, that's your neighbor. Now, a morally restrained heart dependent on the law asks the question, who do I have to love? But a supernaturally transformed heart resting in the gospel asks, who can I love? There's a difference between those two. Who can I love? In our flesh... Galatians, Paul, in Galatians 5, Paul is talking about the flesh versus the spirit. In our flesh, our tendency is to love who? People who reciprocate love. You love me, so I'll love you. It's like the Barney song, but I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> Though it's already in your head, isn't it? It's going to be stuck there. In the flesh, if you don't love me, I won't love you. But in the Spirit, we are called to love our neighbor. In the Spirit, we are called to love people who I don't know. People who bother me. People I don't get along with. People that are really hard to love. People that are different than me. People that are, dare I say, on the opposite of the political spectrum than me. People who are commenting in the same Facebook thread as me. Just because we're behind a keyboard doesn't mean we need to love people any less. And I could go on. We don't love someone because they love us. We love because God loves us and gave his son as a ransom for us. Sometimes loving comes easier than other times. It doesn't mean we're called to love any less or to submit ourselves to the spirit and embrace the call to love any less. One more practical thing to put out there is identifying barriers to showing love, to living out love. What does that mean? It's, it's recognizing those things that prevent us from demonstrating the love that the gospel calls us to. I'll use myself as an example because I'm here and I'm the one speaking. For, for me, a barrier to loving well is 
being overwhelmed. It's probably, if I look back on my top ten list of unloving moments, inevitably when I'm overwhelmed and super stressed out, too much on my plate, um, love gets pushed to like the back burner, everything that I have on my mind gets pushed to the front, someone comes and pops that bubble, and all of a sudden, not love comes out. I don't identify that as an excuse, like if I'm like, I'm stressed out. I don't need to apologize. Well, that's not true. Identifying those things that block us from loving is not so as we can make an excuse about it, but it's so we can recognize it, catch it, and say, God, I really need you now. I really need you to produce in me love because I'm afraid I'm not, and I'm just going to add another one to the top 10 list, and that thing's going to become a top 15 and a top 20. What barriers keep you from loving? It's a practical question. I think we all have to answer that question. And then as we go through these other aspects of the fruit, we'll probably have to answer what, what barrier keeps me from being joyful or for being patient. What barriers quiet the spirit and let out the flesh? Maybe that's something you guys can discuss in community groups. And I'll close with this reminder. Again, I'm going to remind you, you're loved. God loves you. He loves me. Even though we bother him, rebel against him, sin against him, he loves us. And through faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, that love becomes relationship. Our lostness goes into life. Have you put your faith and trust in the finished work of Christ? Are you seeking justification through the things that you do, through just trying to, to love and be a good person, but you're missing the motivation for that love, and that's relationship with God? Have you put your faith and trust in him? I implore you to accept the gift of love God has given us through his son to confess and repent of sin and put your faith and trust in him and experience a loving relationship with God. And in that relationship, love doesn't just flow to us. It should flow through us, through the work of the Spirit. As we experience the love of God, we demonstrate and declare that love to others in a selfless, sacrificial way. As evidence that the gospel has saved us that the Spirit is at work in us and in showing internal gospel growth. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful and thankful for your love and your mercy. That while we didn't have it right, you didn't wait for us, but you pursued us. You sent your Son. Father, help us to relish in that. Help us now to con confess and get out of the way all those things that are keeping us from loving you and loving others. Help your gospel to be ever-present on our minds. And may your spirit be at work in us, producing love so that we can demonstrate and declare your gospel to others through love and truth. And in Jesus' name we pray.